uh, I'll be completing 30 years uh, this month on June 20th. I'll finish 30 years of my career. But okay. I think for the first maybe 18 years, I was, <laughs> I mean, I really didn't know much. People like him, then Asit Kotecha, Nimisha, these were some of the idols. So when I met one of my idols, I was very, uh, like, sort of, uh, I don't know what to say, I was benumbed. And uh, so, <laughs> and somehow it so happened that he offered me a job in the first meeting. So he just met me once and he offered me a job there and then and I was ecstatic. So I realized after some time that equity research is really not, you know, my field. Because I am a little impulsive. And I like to do many things rather than go too deep into something, into any one piece. So and in 2010, when uh, the fund was, uh, again, Mr. Parikh and uh, Rajiv Thakkar, they thought of launching a fund due to certain uh, impending changes in income tax which were proposed at that time. So due to which PMS uh, would have turned out to be very tax unfriendly. So when they were due to launch the fund, Mr. Pari again approached me, asking if I would be keen on coming back. So I was more than happy again. And so from 2010 onwards, again, I'm there over here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Talks with Dalat, where our goal is to deconstruct the seemingly complex world of finance for you and help you take better and relevant investment decisions for yourself. My name is Varun Fatepuria, and I am the founder and CEO of Dalat Wealth Management. I'm usually on the other side of the table, so this is definitely a welcome change for me today. The focus of our podcast series typically have been on individual items and news topics where we have gone through each one of them in greater detail. However, today we will be doing things a bit differently. We would be inviting guests from uh, the mutual fund industry and the investment world to help you understand this space that much better. These experts typically have decades of experience behind them, and we feel that this would be a great value add to our listeners and viewers. And to that extent, our first guest on the show today is Mr. Jayanth Pai, Chief Marketing Officer of Parak Parik Mutual Fund. Jayanth heads the online and the offline marketing function of the AMC. Prior to joining this, he worked in a similar capacity at the sponsor company of the fund, the Parak Parik Financial Advisory Services. Previously, he had held stints in institutional equity sales at HSBC, Invest Direct Securities, and at Tower Capital. Jayant, it is a pleasure to have you on our show today. Hi, Varun. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Great, Jayant. So we'll quickly begin by exploring your own journey into this asset management space, something that is really coming of the age in India in the last few years. And more specifically, how did you get your start uh, into the Parak Parik family, first with their PMS and now with the mutual fund? Yeah, so actually, uh, I mean, no one in my family is into stocks or into funds or whatever. But uh, in the year 1990, uh, I had a group of friends in my college. So I was in HR college in Bombay. And uh, so I heard them talking about stocks. And coincidentally, their index Sensex touched 1000 in that period. So July 1990. Okay. So that ignited my interest in this. And uh, my grandmother gave me 20,000 rupees that time. <laughs> and said, you, no one in my family, in our family is keen on this, but I'm seeing that you are interested. So go ahead and do what you want with this. <laughs> so I don't know, it was a doublet sword because <laughs> that was a lot of money when you don't earn anything. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's how the journey began. Of course, a lot of mistakes on the way. And, uh, but luckily I had a lot of good mentors you know who always uh, protected me so the guardrails were people who were uh, uh, already there into markets or if not into markets but at least into finance as such because in my family there are more of doctors so there are uh, so no, nobody was into personal finance or corporate finance or whatever but uh, so when i began my career in 1993 uh, so there was this person called utpal shet who is now with rare enterprises so I consider him as my first mentor. So he gave me an opportunity when, even before my BCom results had come out. So that was really great. I mean, he took a chance on me. And so that's how my career began. And uh, he had a lot of ideas, which now I think were really visionary. So much before f and started in India and all, he already had chalked out plans on strategies and this and that. And yeah. even regular equity research. So that's how it began for me. And after that, I've done various things within this field. So I've done, uh, so I realized after some time that equity research is really not, you know, my field because I am a little impulsive 
and i like to do many things rather than go too deep into something into any one thing so then i did various things like dealing and institutional dealing retail dealing and uh, but ultimately when the cfp course was launched in india in 2002 i realized that this is my calling because i was mostly interested in personal finance so then i finished that uh, so i was part of the first batch so finished that in 2004 and uh, there was a chance meeting with mr parak parekh uh, because he was a grandfather member a grandfather cfp so there some key members of industry were uh, accorded the designation by the institute so i met him as uh, to invite him for one of the events that uh, we were organizing and uh, he was one of our idols in college also so people like him then asit kotecha nimisha these were some of the idols so when i met one of my idol i was very uh, like sort of uh, i don't know what to say i was be numb and uh, so <laughs> and somehow it so happened that he offered me a job in the first meeting so he just met me once and he offered me a job there and then and i was ecstatic so that was so that this happened in around 2004 end and so since then i am there with them and uh, in again in different capacity so i started off in on the broking side because we were mainly brokers at that time and uh, pms of course was there but i was more on the institutional broking so uh, there were several uh, mutual funds at that time birla and all that who knew him as a person but somehow the business side was not very active so i just activated that i just served the brand actually the brand was already there but it was a little dormant so i just had to activate some of that uh, he also saw that i was keen on personal finance so we set up a personal finance unit within the company mm-hmm. this was in 2007 and uh, so the pms was part of that so we sold the pms as part of the personal finance offering uh, after that i took a short break from the company and then went to uh, this uh, island fs uh, invest mart which then became hsbc invest direct and in 2010 when uh, the fund was uh, again mr parikh and uh, rajiv thakkar they thought of launching a fund due to certain uh, impending changes in income tax which were proposed at that time so due to which pms uh, would have turned out to be very tax unfriendly so when they were due to launch the fund mr parikh again approached me asking if i would be keen on coming back so i was more than happy again and so from 2010 onwards again i'm there over here so that's my journey great jan so thank you so much for putting light on your illustrious career and really you know getting started with a brand which is not really well known at a certain point in time i think only when we look back in hindsight we realize the importance of you know sticking with a certain group of people having that conviction to see it through right and that is also seen in the performance of the fund right i mean when uh, parak parek got started with its flexi cap fund 10 years back i think it recently completed its 10th year anniversary right and it has really come a long way from managing a meager i would say 60 65 odd crores in may of 2013 to over mm-hmm. 35000 crores today right i mean that growth has really been stupendous so yeah. if you could just elaborate on the success of the fund we all know that uh performance typically i mean obviously aum follows performance right and so much of that growth has really come in the last few years but you guys have been sticking to your own style of investing over the last 10 years right so could you just elaborate on the success of the fund how how have you and the team has been able to see it through in the last 10 years yes actually let's step uh, beyond 10 years so let's go back to say 2002 because that was the time when rajiv thakkar actually uh, held uh, he uh, took the reins of the pms so the portfolio management scheme which was actually launched in 1996 but then it was uh, uh, run by a couple of other fund managers for the first 6 years so rajiv came on board in 2001 into the company and from 2002 he became the fund manager so and i have been seeing him since 2005 so i have i personally don't think there's much difference in what uh, in the way the pms was run and the fund was run so the fund is more an extension of the thought process of the pms of course the fund gives us a lot of latitude on various fronts for instance uh, the onboarding is easier uh, because of the common kyc then uh, because it's a non segregated account you don't have to again uh, 
you know waste time in splitting the orders uh, into separate accounts um, but apart from the procedural part the thought process behind the stock selection i felt is more or less same so uh, so that way it, the things don't seem very unique to me because i've seen both sides but yeah the kind of freedom we have now in terms of uh, investing abroad and in undertaking larger positions uh, simply because we have more money at our disposal and that certainly helps and uh, somehow it still seems like a dream to me <laughs> i am telling you yeah. this <laughs> so it's a tale of two halves actually so from 2013 till around 2019 end so and the post covid period so you we could split this entire 10 years into two parts so i remember in 2013 when we just launched the nfo rajiv had told us over on the marketing side that don't be in a hurry don't push things beyond uh, i mean don't try to needlessly make things happen things will right. happen because we need some performance we need people to generally uh, be aware of what we are a very small section already knew us because we were running a pms but it was a very localized sort of operation so we had a lot of hnis based in south mumbai they were our main plants but you know actually when we launched the fund my geography actually improved because we started seeing money from places where i did not even know existed because of the online thing which which is again a big advantage so which we didn't have with uh, with the uh, the pms so uh, slowly things started happening there were a lot of initial champions of the fund even in places like chennai and all that chennai bangalore there were a few pms clients who spread the word and and luckily for us some the so called platforms which today are paytm and uh, kuvera and all that at that time we had this funds india and fund supermart these were the mutual fund distributors they uh, took a uh, chance on us right from beginning right from before the nfo so automatically many of their clients who uh, knew little bit about parag parik as a person they came on board and slowly that part uh, happened uh, you know sort of uh, we as a fund could not, could not have make make it happen so easily without the support of these distributors uh then we also slowly set up our own uh, mobile app and uh, you know our uh, those channels so things started coming in from there uh but see un- underlying all this is the same principle that we have been following so for instance in 2007 i remember this when we had the commodity boom you know where materials and all these uh, mining stocks and uh, choose loan and all these things they started going up raji was very clear that we are not going to invest in such things and he he had this thing that i don't mind losing clients but i don't want to lose my clients money so that was the uh, foundation on which we operated and the same thing continued when the uh, even in on two three occasions during after the fund was launched say in 2017 was one example when lot of mid cap stocks were just going up you know without a break we stayed away from that and even so uh, so again they say that fortune favors a prepared mind so uh, here what was happening is that we could not really uh, pinpoint when some inflection point will take place but we are generally ready for it and that's what i have seen with rajiv he is a little bit ahead of time but he has the conviction to stay put and uh, and this company i think has given him a lot of freedom to do that so mr parik uh, personally supported him many times you know when which i don't know how many promoters would have done because there were times when we actually lost clients but you know parak parik had a lot of faith in rajiv's way of operating uh, which even today his son neel parik he also is showing us a lot him a lot of support so that is continuing and uh, so what happened was Uh, as covid just uh, the first signs of covid were seen we were around 18% in cash okay. so we had already a watch list uh, which included some foreign stocks and several indian also uh, which we got a good chance to deploy during that period so from around march 2020 till around july august whatever those three four months we reduced our cash positions from around 18% to around 5% and 
every month as the performance numbers started coming, people started noticing her. So that's how the, the initial uh, so-called second leg of this fund uh, was definitely due to the uh, COVID-related benefit. But that benefit wouldn't have occurred if we were fully invested. Correct. Sorry, UM was much smaller. Uh, I don't remember the exact number. I think it was only, I don't know, some thousand crores or something. Okay. So, but the, the thing is that the thought process was the same that time. It's the same today also. Today also we are around 16% in cash. So because, uh, I don't know, I am not privy to every thought of Raji. But what we feel is that he must be feeling that things are a little stretched or whatever. So whenever he has something to say, he writes notes. You may have gone through his notes, uh, which are there on our website. So those give a good insight into his thought process. And we also hold the unit holder meets. These are some of the other ways we try to differentiate. So one is in the scheme design. So in 2013, when we launched the scheme, that is FlexiCap, that time it was called long-term value fund. So the name of this scheme has changed many times, not because we wanted it to change, but due to regulatory reasons. So whenever SEBI comes out with any recategorization and this and that, we are compelled to change the name so that we are congruent with what the category demands. So we uh, currently it is the flexi cap category. So, but again, what we are doing within that is more or less same what we used to do uh, from beginning. Right. Uh, so then uh, this uh, two, three things which we see, Parakwari always see, we had a lot of mutual fund clients, you know, uh, as brokers, when we used to talk to them, uh, we used to feel that they are under certain set of compulsions, which are actually inimical to the growth of their own scheme. So if the fund manager wants to do something, but that fund manager is unable to do it simply because of pressure from other sources, say the sales team or whatever. So we wanted to have a fund which is free of such things. So uh, <clears throat> where the fund management team will have priority over all other things. So that was uh, how it uh, began. And so that's why there was no great marketing push or anything in the right. beginning. Similarly, we did not give distributors uh, differentiated commission because we didn't want that incentive to skew the uh, decision of the distributor. Right. So that was one. And we were more on the side of the small guys because we were ourselves small. Right. So we didn't want the IFA, the independent financial advisors, to feel that we were prioritizing somebody else. Correct. And even today, that's the same thing. We are not giving different uh, differentiated commission. So that has certainly hurt us in some ways, but it's okay. So so many of those people who did not want to come on board that time, now they're coming on board simply because their own clients are demanding it. Right, right, yeah. So that's one yeah. thing. Other thing was the unit holder meets. So the unit holder meet concept is unique to our fund. And the fourth thing which uh, is unique is the skin in the game part before SEBI made it mandatory. So from the first month, we have been displaying our own holding. So even my holding, you can check it out on the website. So we have a section called skin in the game where our own holdings are displayed. So this shows that we are having conviction in our own scheme. So, so this is it. So yeah, from around 64 crores to whatever, 40,000 crores is a dream. Yeah. But now, but now that the, the challenge is that people now expect a lot from us. So they, so the benefit of being a small fund is not there anymore. Right. So when people are giving, willing to cut some slack, now they expect us to be very good on all fronts. So whether it is customer service or uh, uh, network uh, or, uh, and of course, return. Everyone is looking at that. Right. So, yeah, so we are cognizant of that and we are careful not to get carried away. Right. So some of the great points, I think, Jen, that you mentioned, right, and that exactly answers my uh, next question that, Parag Parikh at that point in time really felt like an antithesis of the entire mutual fund industry, right? Like having one singular yeah. flagship fund, having one commission for all distributor approach, pioneering international investing, having these unit holders meet, right? I think when I look at myself or even 
for that matter our firm either as an intermediary advisor or even for that matter as an individual investor i think all of these really imparts a lot of confidence in uh, from a transparency point of view we exactly know that what the fund is doing they are singularly focused on one particular strategy and the fund managers are open to meet you whenever you want to meet them right i think it that it is that level of transparency that level of approachability that has imparted confidence into a lot of the unit holders you are correct to mention that yes i think uh, starting small it is not really easy to get to a scale where you have reached in the last few years right and all of these things naturally just take time you cannot push i think when you're into the money man management business you cannot really push something onto people right i think uh, you need to deliver on your performance and automatically i think clients and the aum will follow so that's a great point that you mentioned i think another thing that has stood out is the big bold focus on value investing right i think that is something that is plastered on your website plastered virtually across all of the marketing materials however we see that there is an equal amount of focus on the fast growing technology sector especially with respect to the international investments so how does the fund really reconcile both of these approaches when they are thinking about value and growth because we see that a lot of the investors usually think of it as an either this or a that approach you could either be a value investor or you could be a growth investor right but we know that the fund typically looks at value and growth a bit differently so if you could just shine a bit more light uh for our uh, uh, viewers and listeners today on that approach yeah so again we have not been fixated on optical value so it's never the cigar butt or the optically cheap bits which you know attract us right from beginning because i've seen rajiv from 2005 and it has never been that uh, so for us value investing is uh, more of is all general investing i mean whenever you invest in something you i mean for us at least we prefer safety over uh, the prospect of super normal return we look at the safety angle first so like i mean people have flogged this buffettism for a long time right right rule number 1 rule number 2 don't forget it but this is really ingrained in our way of thinking so we take lot of care before we invest so what happens is that we usually choose stocks where uh, which haven't uh, which may not have run up a lot or whatever or which may have fallen for some reason say some pharma companies here and there whenever some fda ruling comes we look at it or if uh, many of the like the stocks which were there on a watch list pre covid you know they were all these so called fancy tech stocks but we got into them after there was a big fall in them so also many of these uh, say things like alphabet and all that when we bought them they were going at very reasonable valuation so there are two ways to look at it one is to just look at the share price performance of the recent past but the second is there is a little bit of forecasting also required so rajiv was very clear in case of google so we bought google roughly in 2015 or something so that time people are asking why why have we bought it so uh, because again the same thing that it it didn't fit into the value category uh, but rajiv's note which uh, was written at that time clearly talked about the opportunity so if you look at the opportunity and that too google had already proved themselves so it's not like a startup so it's not like a loss making startup which we got in so <clears throat> google had already uh, was there for i think since 98 or something google uh, then 2004 they came with the ip yeah uh, so they were already there in the business for 20 odd years and but the kind of prospect especially in new markets was something which uh, rajiv uh, thought was worth taking a a chance on. so when we bought google it was going at around some 28 times earning which was very reasonable compared to what was going on in the rest of the market and uh, in the non tech sector so many non techs were higher than that so google with already a proven track record had uh, i mean it was being valued at a reasonable rate in case of amazon and all of course the share price run up was quite scary uh, but when we bought it there was a steep fall so we bought after a steep fall so in most of the cases it will be like this so there were some stocks which were optically 
sort of uh, uh, falling into the value category. Say, for example, Noida Toll Bridge or say in the olden days, I'm talking, see, we have held some stocks since beginning. So right from our first fact sheet till now, there are a few stocks which we have held. For example, Ikra we have held throughout, then Axis Bank. Uh, so uh, those things, whatever reasoning was there that time, if somebody looks at that and, and sees the current things, they might say that it doesn't fit in. But at that time, it did fit in. In some cases, the prices ran up a lot. So we did sell. For example, Apple was one case where we bought and sold quite quickly within a few months. So then again, people are asking that what are you doing? You all have sold so fast. But see, it's a dynamic thing. Yeah. So we, uh, we are not fixated on any one particular dogma. We are open to things, but the, like, as I said, I don't see any great change in the way we are managing money in 2005 also and uh, now also. But yeah, as more and more people come into the fund, for us, the challenge is to keep on uh, reiterating this. So the, our communication is always based on these things of uh, how, uh, see, one more thing is this categorization of SEBI into different things. So value is one of the categories. We consciously chose not to, uh, you know, like uh, bucket ourselves into that. Because then that would have really constricted us in many ways. Things that we may not have been clear at that point in time. So we prefer to choose a more omnibus category. Like I think we chose multi-cap before that and now flexi-cap. Mm, flexi-cap, yeah. yeah. So this gives us a freedom to do things. So for instance, it also, even apart from this, the value part, there's the freedom to stay in cash. That itself is a big luxury. So which many schemes prior to us, they actually constricted themselves by, uh, you know, inserting in their mandate only that they cannot be more than five to 6% in cash. But we did not do that. So, but yet to give our unit holders the benefit of equity taxation, we chose the arbitrage. So whenever we, uh, you know, there was a dearth of ideas, we parked the money in arbitrage. So, because arbitrage is treated as equity by, uh, for the purposes of taxation. So that was good. So th that helped us. So it also gave us the gunpowder to use it whenever we wanted. So even today, our, if you see the fact sheet, there is a good mix of cash is not just cash lying in the bank. It's in various instruments. Right. So that gives us some leeway, but so one good thing about uh, the fund management team is that they don't panic if there is too much of cash, which is very difficult to do because I remember in 2019 end, there were articles against us in the media, which not against against as such, but we were held as a symbol for people who were stubborn, you know, who, <laughs> who were not willing to accept that markets are going up. And we were in uh, an abnormal, we are holding an abnormal amount of cash. So if I remember correctly, the gap between us and the next fund at that time, uh, in terms of the cash balance, was roughly around uh, maybe 800 bips or something. Okay. It was quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. It was quite a lot. And see, that time the media, some people in the media knew us, the seniors. But many of the junior journalists and all, they were not really knowing much about how we operate. So, but now slowly people are aware, okay, that this is how we do it. And uh, many other schemes are also, uh, they give their fund managers more leeway nowadays. And plus we have a lot of new categories like this multi-asset category. And uh, so, uh, like, uh, there are other funds which promote a certain uh, scheme based on the market. So, yeah. if balance funds or something are there, they promote saying that we have the freedom to stay in cash. Right. But this wasn't the case 10 years back. So maybe that, so there are many things I think, I mean, there's just a joke in office that, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it's just a joke. Don't take it seriously. Yeah. <laughs> people say that uh, the regulators often look at us and then bring about changes. So right. for example, skin in the game, which they made mandatory. And uh, some of the categories which have come. So they say, so in that way, we are... Uh, the pioneers in many things. So that is just a joke. But yeah, but it, it's just, but we are comfortable doing it. And the thing is that SEBI never prevented things. So when we launched the scheme in 2013, uh, 
SEBI always never said you cannot invest in international and local together. It's just that, I mean, nobody was doing it. Right. So that's it. So we just read the rules more closely and we found out that it's possible. Great. All right. <laughs> So, Jayan, just uh, just some final thoughts uh, for our viewers and listeners uh, on how do you think, given your decades of experience in this field, how do you think, uh, because we see a lot of investors now dabbling into direct equities and, you know, playing with exotic options and FNOs and all of those things. And for someone who has spent time in the industry, almost always it feels like, you know, in the bull market, definitely those options do look very exciting. But over a longer period of time, that is something that needs to be done really carefully, right? So how, what advice would you give to our viewers and listeners today on how best to use mutual funds as an investment vehicle uh, to reach their personal financial goals? Yes, there are all the benefits of being regulated and diversified and having a fund manager, so on and so forth. Someone who knows the industry very well do appreciate that. But we, again, see a lot of investors not really appreciating the value of mutual funds as an investment vehicle. Uh, yeah, I think everyone should know themselves first before knowing all these products. I mean, I can tell from my own experience. So, actually, it, it sounds funny, but the reason why I did CFP in 2002 was because I got uh, enamored by this concept called SIP which people started talking of in 2001 after the dot-com bust. You know, some papers started talking about this concept of, I think uh, the first one to promote this concept was uh, Samir Arora in uh, roughly 2000-2001. So, uh, so that's what got me into this thing, into mutual funds as such, because I was a broker and I was all into direct stock. So my own DMAT account used to have 40, 50 stocks and doing all weird things. So in my case, the best thing I did was close my DMAT account in 2012. And uh, since then, I, I'm free of this urge to trade. And uh, so this urge to, to do something, that is the biggest bugbear in investing. Right. So because there is so much of stimulus all around you. So uh, the like... Buffett says the toughest thing is to just sit in a room and do nothing. So what I feel is that people institute, today it's very easy to begin things. Say, for example, right. you can commence a, a SIP online. You can, people say that they want to do SIP till the year 2100 and all that. <laughs> but, uh, and they, they actually start certain things. But the problem with SIP, unlike insurance, is that it's very easy to stop. Right. I really wish they make SIP as difficult as insurance to exit. But uh, like in insurance, you know how it is. Once you get in, the, uh, it's virtually impossible to get out without yeah, paying a hefty, a hefty fine or something like that. Yeah. So even in a term plan, I mean, it is very difficult to mentally to convince yourself to stop it. And in, in terms of the traditional products, it's too bad. You really lose money. In term plan, you don't lose anything. But you still have that thing, okay, I've already done for 10 years. Let me pay for 10 more years. Because anything may happen. But in SIP, it's not so. So, uh, some funds try to put exit loads and all to dissuade people. But I think the education that all funds should be doing is the benefit of not doing anything. So, which is a paradox. So, but the thing is that once you decide on something, just keep, just don't overthink it. So, that is one. I think that is the best way to just, so, you know, the power of compounding and all people know it in, they know it intellectually, yeah. but the power, the actual experiential benefit, I think is only which something which one generation can convey to the other generation because it takes a lot of time. So today, so for instance, in both my, in, in case of both my kids, so one was born in 2002 and one in 2007. So in their case, from the first month only, whatever I've done, so that when I show it to them, they are very happy. But I tell them that this shows that when you all begin earning, this is what you should be doing. So that so one is to, when they see the numbers, they are happy, but this, it's also a kind of a signal that this, this is what works. And uh, I mean, there are many things. So one is that people waste a lot of time in predicting things. You know, so there are two things. One is predicting and second is uh, believing that what happened before will happen again. So both the things are not really correct. So I think we should not dwell too much on all this. And just keep, see, and life is much more than all this. Yeah? I mean, 
I really believe so once the SIP program is in place, you just go and enjoy life. Right. People are so much forget about all these things. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's I true. Think that should be the least sort of uh, your mind space. Should least mind space should be occupied by such things. Uh, so, but at the same time, you cannot ignore it. So, I think it's good to talk to some professionals also. I mean, professional advisors because they will keep you tethered. That's what I believe. Because this do-it-yourself is good, but it can be a double-edged sword. Because there's nobody to stop you from doing wrong things. So, so I think, so if you know yourself, see, I'm very impulsive. So, I know what I should not be doing, but I learned it after a long time. So, I'll be completing 30 years uh, this month, on June 20th. I'll finish 30 years of my career. But okay. I think for the first maybe 18 years, I was, <laughs> I mean, I really didn't know much. So, also coming into this company, that is PPFS, has helped me to be grounded. Because you know how it is in finance, if you are in a wrong company, by company, I mean the place, the employer also, and the people whom you work with, then it's very difficult. So, peer pressure also plays a big role. So, here everybody thinks similar in this company. And uh, so Mr. Parikh used to say that I give everyone a long enough rope. So if they are not good, they'll hang themselves with it. So mm -hmm. only the people who are, who are comfortable with our way of thinking, they have survived. And the employee turnover is pretty low here. So we know each other for a long time. So that also helps. So it's a, it's a combination of things. Yeah. So it's not just mathematical or emotional. It's a mix of both things. And keep learning as you go. So what works for you may not work for me. But that doesn't mean that you should give, give up what works for you. So, so I say that just means just tell people that just close your ears and keep your eyes open and just keep investing. Great. And again, don't overdo it. Like don't have 20 mutual fund schemes or right. just fair enough. So, and don't get too much fixated on active versus passive. Just keep doing. Your people spend a lot of time on talking. Yeah. So I, I think talk less and just put your head down and just let the numbers show themselves in some time. So that is the best proof you can give others. So, All right. Great. Uh, thank you so much for such an insightful I mean, I session, Jayan. Yeah, I hope that didn't sound too pontificating. I mean, I don't like to talk all these things. I just got yeah. like sort of Formally, I used to be very passionate about all this, but I realized mm -hmm. even if I tell people something now, after some time, after six months, they'll ask me the same thing. So I just yeah. stopped <laughs> telling all this. But yeah. since you asked, do it. <laughs> no, fair enough. I think this was a great and a very insightful session for all our viewers and listeners today. Right? I think Jayant come with the decades of experience behind him. So if any one of you are able to even take some points that he mentioned, I'm sure your investing journey would become that much smoother. And uh, we'll continue with this series of talks with Dollar. We'll inviting uh, guests and experts from uh, different mutual funds and investment community uh, until the next one. Hope you all have a good day and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Will. Bye. Bye, everyone.